having a problem with uh, 30% of our population not wanting to get oh. vaccinated even when it's available even our hospital staff 30% is not vaccinated and uh, we can't make it mandatory because it's not uh, completely fda approved it's only emergency authorization All right, so I will go off video um, so that you all can concentrate on your talk yeah, uh, and then I'll come back on, okay? Well, yeah. thank you for the introduction and I will uh, yeah. meet you all, all uh, in uh, 10 days or so. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, uh, I think we'll start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome for um, the grand round. It's, uh, today, it's going to be an important topic. Um, a difficult airway, what next when uh, can't intubate and can't ventilate? Um, uh, many of us uh, face situations, particularly in the emergency department, uh, the operation data ICU, or in the wards where it suddenly patient has some respiratory problem and uh, we need to intubate. And uh, at that moment, you know, uh, uh, there could be uh, many hurdles uh, to intubate the patient the right way. And uh, uh, this topic is going to be uh, and most important for uh, uh, medical students, interns, residents, and uh, all the faculty members. Um, uh, so today we have Professor uh, Ashish Bhagis from the Department of ENT and uh, Professor Christina George uh, from the Anesthesia Department. Uh, they'll be discussing about uh, the various uh, scenarios, how we can tackle these patients. And, uh, and before that, I uh, invite Dr. Uh, William Bhatti um, to say a few words. Sir, you're muted. Dr. William, you're muted. We can't hear you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Jaraj. It's a very important topic. Our, we ourselves, uh, being a pediatric surgeon, have faced this problem 
uh, on table we have realized uh, we are not able to intubate the patient and on many occasions patients are being referred from other hospital to us for surgery reason being outside they were not able to intubate the uh, patient so i am glad uh, we are discussing this topic on today's grand rounds and i am sure dr uh, ashish and uh, dr christina they will answer a lot of our queries thank you yeah thank you and uh, we also welcome dr pratik uh, pandari pandey from uh, uh, nashville uh, vanderbilt uh, university uh, thank you for joining us and also we uh, would be uh, having many other uh, uh, um, you know, doctors from mission hospitals and also baptist hospital uh, bangalore uh, some of the anesthesia colleagues uh, will be joining us so over to dr ashish and dr christina Dr. Ashish, they are mute actually. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, what would you do if you have uh, cases that I'm going to present? How would you manage? Okay. So these three cases that you know, um, those are the three cases which made us think that you know this is an important topic and we need to present. So these three patients. The first patient is a 54-year-old male. who presented to us with a history of swelling in the region of tongue and change in voice he had taken tablet nemesulide which is a banned drug quite some time back this was some 4 years back we had this case he had taken tablet nemesulide and he developed edema which was not so bad when he came to us we gave him steroids he was on put on steroids and we said let's observe whether he improves and the oropharynx and the larynx was appearing as if somebody has injected some saline you know it was all bloated up the edema was symmetrical and it was all bloated up as if somebody has given injection saline into the airway and we thought the steroids would improve we waited for almost 8 to 10 hours instead of improving it got worse so we did a we planned a tracheostomy for him we shifted the patient to uh, the ot and as we were shifting the patient from the trolley to the operating table patient stopped breathing what would you do you can't intubate you can't ventilate because this patient has a airway which is all edematous and he stopped breathing you don't have time 4 minutes of cessation of respiration produces irreversible hypoxic brain damage so you have less than 4 minutes in your hand and you can't intubate you can't ventilate what would you do the second patient the second patient was a 14 year old child who was being planned for a urological procedure in the ot number 3 and we were in ot number 4 and we got a call we can't intubate we can't ventilate saturation is dropping you are in the next ot why don't you please come uh, i went to the ot and i took the laryngoscope and i examined saturation was almost 50 to 40 to 50 range and i saw this this is the epiglottis and there is a large valvular cyst reducing the airway and the larynx the epiglottis is falling onto the posterior pharyngeal wall and the airway is getting completely occluded so once the relaxant was given the epiglottis was totally falling onto the posterior pharyngeal wall again you can't intubate can't ventilate what would you do the third patient he was a 56 year old male who presented to us with ludwig's angina he had trismus mouth opening was only one finger the procedure had to be done under general anesthesia how would you access the airway so these are the three cases that we had and so today we are going to you know present to you how to evaluate a difficult airway how to plan access to a difficult airway so we would be talking about you know the various uh, uh, non surgical interventions and the surgical interventions and once the patient has a surgical intervention how to plan a decannulation 
we would be talking about that briefly about care of tracheostomy and you know that would be the you know and then we would of course have a quiz for the medical students and the residents at the end we have ent faculty who would be monitoring the quiz and uh, we would see who is the first and uh, the winner would be announced at the end of question answer session so let's start i would request dr uh, christina to talk about how to evaluate a difficult airway so dr christina thank you dr ashish so uh, keeping these three cases in mind let us understand what a difficult airway is a difficult airway is defined as a clinical situation in which a conventionally trained anesthesiologist experiences difficulty with face mask ventilation of the upper airway a difficulty with tracheal intubation or a difficulty with both this is defined by the difficult airway society so what comprises a difficult airway it's a complex interaction between patient factors that means whether the patient is obese any specific airway characteristics clinical setting for example if it's a long standing diabetes with uh, reduced uh, tm joint uh, mobility cervical spine mobility and the skills of the practitioner very important three important factors in deciding how we are going to tackle this difficult airway so this again is subdivided into five parts first being difficult face mask ventilation a difficult supraglottic airway device placement a difficult laryngoscopy difficult tracheal intubation and finally a failed intubation so difficult mask ventilation is defined as the inability of an unassisted that is a single anesthesiologist to maintain oxygen saturation to more than 92% or prevent or the reverse the signs of inadequate ventilation using positive pressure ventilation under general anesthesia that means a single anesthesiologist anesthesiologist fails to maintain a saturation of more than 92% now two you can see two pictures here one of an elderly gentleman with uh, totally who's got hollow cheeks edentulous this kind of situation is becomes a challenge for us while we are mass ventilating and the other situation is where the patient is morbidly obese and here again it's difficult to maintain the seal with a mask now the problems with mass ventilation can happen both before intubation or after repeated attempts at intubation and a failure and subsequently again trying to mass ventilate so what are the signs of inadequate mass ventilation since there is no passage of air from the mouth down to the lungs there is absence of chest movement absence of breath sounds signs of severe obstruction on auscultation cyanosis when the saturation is dipping to less than 80% there is stomach insufflation dipping oxygen saturation absent or inadequate exchange of carbon dioxide and uh, <clears throat> inadequate gas exchange on the spirometry so and the repercussions of this would be the hemodynamic changes that are associated with uh, steadily increasing hypoxemia or hypercarbia which would be a rise in blood pressure a tachycardia and various ventricular and other arrhythmias so a difficult laryngoscopy as defined by the american society of anesthesiologists task force is when it is not possible to visualize any portion of the vocal cords with a conventional direct laryngoscopy and this equates to grade 4 laryngoscopy by cormac and lehan so what is cormac lehan grading this is grade 1 2 3 and 4 grade 1 is where you can see the epiglottis and the vocal cords clearly partial uh, visualization of cords and the epiglottis coming to two grade 3 and grade 2 have been further divided subdivided uh, to classify under difficult uh, intubation now what we are concerned here is mainly with grade 3 and grade 4 where we are not able to see the vocal cords and here we are not even able to see the glottis and the epiglottis these are the two important ban gaya roti adda ban gaya now difficult intubation is defined as the difficulty when there is 
when proper insertion of the tracheal tube in conventional laryngoscopy is needing more than three attempts or a duration of more than 10 minutes. Now, now, to understand all this, we need to understand the steps to manage the difficult airway. And it starts with assessment of the airway, followed by preparation of both an anticipated difficult airway or an unanticipated difficult airway. You were not prepared, you were not expecting it to be a difficult airway, and you are uh, surprisingly encountering it probably on the, on the operating table. And finally, extubation of this difficult airway. So assessment is further divided into one, a complete history to detect the medical, surgical, and anesthetic factors which, uh, which lead us to uh, detecting and diagnosing a difficult airway, an examination of the previous anesthetic records if the patient underwent uh, previous surgery and he has a medical uh, record uh, telling us of an anticipated difficult airway, specific airway physical uh, characteristics which are seen in such patients, and further evaluation in patients who have anticipated difficult airway and the need for subsequent consultations. So what uh, is seen in the general physical examination, you probably would come across a small mouth, a receding chin, a high arched palate, a large tongue in morbidly obese patients. There could be patients with orthodontic uh, equipment, dental implants. There could be a hypertrophic turbinate, a deviated nasal septum and uh, nasal polyps. So many such conditions can come in the way. Now, the airway physical examination has a battery of tests, which always begins with history, looking out for a pathology associated with difficult intubation, <coughs> clinical symptoms which uh, patient might present. Pa patient may say he has breathlessness already, he could have noisy breathing while sleeping. The Malampatti score, which uh, I will come, uh, come to in details, the upper lip bite test, the hyoid mandibular distance, which is a distance from the hyoid to the mandible, the tem temporomandibular joint movement, whether the range of motion is adequate, the anterior and the posterior flexion of the cervical spine, the mandibular length, which can be uh, assessed or radiologically, a neck circumference of more than 40 centimeters would classify as difficult intubation, the thyromental distance and sternometal distance and the inter-incisor gap. These are some of the indices which comprise uh, the physical examination. Now, if you come across such a difficult airway, it is important to inform the patient and their practitioners and obtain a medical alert bracelet. So the airway assessment can be classified into individual indices, the standalone tests like the cormac lehan uh, grading, which helps you identify and prepare for a difficult airway. Here you can see grade 1, 2A, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3, 3B. So this has been subclassified for purposes of uh, assessing a difficult airway. Or there could be group indices, for example, uh, lemon, we'll come to this. And finally, radiological assessment, for example, a helical CT, which helps us get the exact location and degree of airway compression. And now uh, look at the flow volume loops to detect any kind of obstructive or restrictive disease, an acoustic response measurement of great importance in ENT, ultrasound uh, guidance and flexible bronchoscope. So individual indices, I'll mention a few of them, which are extremely important. That is the distance from the manubrium sternum to the mentum, the thyroid uh, cartilage to the mentum. These distances have already been uh, <coughs> assessed. And if it is less than the values that are provided, then we know that the patient is uh, probably having an anticipated difficult airway or the submental space. For example, putting pressure on the submental space and patient uh, exerting a deep, uh, taking a deep breath followed by a deep expiration. And if there is no palpable uh, higher bone and you feel that it is not, it's not compliant, then you know that it is a positive submental uh, space and we are going to face difficulty. Or for example, here in diabetes, we come across patients with a palmer print sign, which is an objective test for the joint mobility or the prayer sign. That is a failure to oppose the pharyngeal, uh, the palmer surfaces of the pharynx or the pharyngeal joints. So these are indicators of difficulty in intubation in patients with long stand di diabetes or the upper lip bite test. Normally, you should be able to bring the mandibular teeth above the maxillary teeth. However, when there is a failure to do so, we come across grade one, where you're barely reaching the vermilion border. You're just reaching below the vermilion border. And finally, the maxillary teeth cannot go above the maxillary teeth. Then the atlanto-occipital extension. Normally, extension should be at least 35%. But when there is a one-third reduction, two-third reduction, and finally, 
no extension at all. These are all going to be indicators of difficulty in incubation. The Malampatti score, as you know, has been uh, classified by uh, Shashadri Malampatti, an Indian origin American anesthesiologist who initially started with three grades but was modified by Samson Young into four grades, where you visualize the hard and the soft palate, Hi. the anterior and the posterior tonsillar pillars. And finally, subsequent grades, you're not even able to see anything beyond the tongue and the hard palate. Now, group indices is where you're clubbing several subheadings, like, for example, Wilson's risk score takes into account the weight, the head and neck movement, the jaw movement, receding mandible and the buck teeth, and it comes to a total score of 8 to 10 if you're encountering difficulty in laryngoscopy. A score of less than 5 means it's going to be an easy laryngoscopy. Now, Murphy and Walls came up with a uh, supraglottic device insertion pneumonic rods, R for a reduced mouth opening, O for obstruction in the airway, D for a distorted airway, and S for stiff neck or lungs. <clears throat> Comac Lehan, I've already uh, mentioned to you. So also is Lemon, where you L stands for looking externally, looking at the airway physical character characteristics, evaluating the 332 rule for the thyroid mental distance, the sternomental distance, the Malampatti score, the obstruction, any, any signs of upper and lower airway obstruction, and the range of neck mobility. Now, predictors of difficult face mask ventilation can be uh, studied by uh, the, uh, the mnemonic obese. O, obese, B, bearded, E, elderly, S, snorers, and E, edentulous. That means these are the kind of patients where we are expecting difficult mask ventilation. And finally, difficulty in surgical access with patients with a bleeding tendency, agitated or restless patient, patient with any previous neck scarring and any growth of vascular abnormalities. Now, radiological assessment takes into account, one, the effective mandibular length, the posterior mandibular depth, the anterior mandibular depth, the atlanto-occipital gap, and the C1, C2 gap. So on the lateral neck x-ray, if the distance between the occipital and the C1 spinous process is less than 5 mm, or if there is an increase in the, in the posterior maxillary mandibular depth to more than 2.5 centimeters, if the ratio of the effective mandibular length to its posterior depth is less than 3.6, it indicates signs of tracheal compression. A CT will help us identify tumors of the floors of the mouth, pharynx, and larynx, any kind of cervical spine trauma, which again could be impinging on the trachea or any mediastinal mass. Now, point of care ultrasound was first, the first paper on this was published in 2011, and it helps us to assess the diameter of the subglottic upper airway and has been of great importance, especially in finding the correct cuffed and the uncuffed ET size in pediatric patients. So the subglottic device uh, diameter, especially you put the probe in anteriorly and you will be able to get this. And you can even see the pre tracheal tissue, uh, <clears throat> which is of great importance in obese patients, where the distance from the skin to the subglottic diameter, it will, you can assess the pre tracheal tissue, which is sitting here, and this will help, is a predictor of the difficult in laryngoscopy in obese patients. Patients who have more pre tracheal to soft tissue and a greater neck circumference are bound to have a difficult laryngoscopy. So it was found that the sonographic measurements of the anterior soft tissue neck thickness at the level of the higher bone and the thorough membrane can be used to distinguish difficult and easy laryngoscopies. However, clinical screening tests do not sometimes correlate with these ultrasound measurements. So this indicates the limitation of conventional screening tests, the ones which we already mentioned, the individual and the group indices, to the superiority of the ultrasound for predicting difficult laryngoscopy. So after assessment is preparation. Preparation includes an airway cart where we have rigid laryngoscope blades of, of different uh, Macintosh, Miller's, uh, McCoy, a video laryngoscope, tubes of different sizes, tube guides, supraglottic airways, both a laryngeal mask airway and an intubating LMA, a flexible fiber optic intubation uh, equipment, and very important to have an uh, exhaled carbon dioxide detector. Now, if anticipated difficult airway, you should inform the patient or his relatives of the special risks and procedures and take a consent. Make sure that there is at least one additional person who can assist you in the airway management and mandatorily provide pre-oxidation to the patient. The ASA practice guidelines provides us techniques for difficult intubation, which ranges from awake intubation 
to a blind intubation, fiber optic, use of an S, uh, SGA as an intubating conduit, different laryngoscope blades, a gum elastic bougie, a video laryngoscope, and even if you're not able to do any of that, a two-person mask ventilation. So proper planning will prevent poor performance. So this, what would be our strategy for intubation of the difficult airway? So guidelines provided by the Difficult Airway Society 2015, the overview for this would be, if you're going, if the, uh, it is an unanticipated difficult airway, plan A would be a face mask ventilation and intubation following a laryngoscopy. You succeed, you go ahead with the intubation, you fail the intubation. Plan B of maintaining the oxygenation using a supraglottic device. And if you succeed, probably this is the time where you, if it's a short surgery, you proceed with the surgery or you need to wake the patient up. If it's, you are used an intubating LMA, you can now insert the tube, the tracheal tube through the SGA. And if nothing works, then go for a surgical access. Now, if you failed the SGA ventilation, you come back to face mask ventilation. This is your final attempt at face mask ventilation. You succeed. This is the time to wake the patient up. Now, if you reach the situation of a can't intubate, can't oxygenate, this is the plan D, where you need to get emergency access, surgical access using a scalpel cricothyroidotomy. Now, in an unanticipated difficult airway, you need to maintain an optimized head and neck position with head extension, appropriate and neck flexion, three minutes, 100% oxygenation, adequate neuromuscular blockade, bearing in mind whether you will be able to reverse, whether you will be able to manage the time of paralysis, using a direct and a video laryngoscope, not more than three attempts, using external lar laryngeal manipulation, a gum elastic bougie, and important emphasis on maintaining oxygenation and anesthesia. Now, if you fail, fail this, plan B would be maintaining oxygenation using a second generation supraglottic device, where you have the provision of your putting a rice tube and preventing aspiration. You can change your device to size and at the same time, emphasis again, oxygenation and ventilation to all points. Now, if this fails again, go to face mask ventilation. Final attempt, you have used a two-person technique. You succeed, you wake the patient up. If not, you declare a can't intubate, can't ventilate situation. So plan D uh, will be discussed by uh, Dr. Ashish. Now, coming to the extubation guidelines. Now, it's very important that you have intubated a difficult airway. You need to extubate also in a planned manner. So you assess the airway and the general risk factors. Optimize the patient and other uh, factors which will be involved. Now, is the patient at a low risk or at a, at a at risk? So according to that, I will uh, come to the algorithm. Now, for a low risk patient, the same planning and preparation, but now you will decide on whether you want a deep extubation or you want an awake extubation. In a deep extubation, you need to be vigilant. Experience matters. And it's important that you wait and observe the patient till the patient is fully awake. However, if you plan an awake extubation, you need to pre-oxygenate with 100% oxygen, appropriate suctioning, inserting a bite block, positioning the patient appropriately, reversing the neuromuscular blockade, waiting for spontaneous breathing, make sure that the patient's muscle bar has recovered, applying positive pressure using 100% oxygen and continuing to supplement oxygen and then shifting the patient to the recovery. Now, in case of an at-risk patient, the planning and preparation is the same. But the main question that is that arises here is, now, is it safe to remove the tube? Are you planning to remove the tube in this patient? So you need to consider these factors now. Is the patient having any cardiac condition? Is he a post-CAVG patient? Is he a patient of COPD? A patient who's running a high fever? Is he obese? What about his neuromuscular? Will he recover from his neuromuscular blockade? Do, we, do I have the adequate equipment and assistance? So depending on that, yes, if I have and I plan to remove the tube, it should always be an awakened extubation in these patients. And uh, in the advanced techniques, you could uh, think of replacing the AT tube with an LMA or using an airway exchange catheter. And if you're not uh, comfortable and you think it is not safe to remove the tube, better to shift the patient with the AT tube in situ to the high dependency unit or the ICU or even plan a tracheostomy if that is the need. So, uh, uh, and accordingly, a safe transfer needs to be carried out. Now, just to mention uh, awake fiber optic intubation, which is one of the important uh, maneuvers that we use, uh, techniques that we use for maintaining an anticipated difficult airway. The transnasal uh, route is the most uh, commonly used and awake intubation is preferred. The ET tube is secured to the flexible uh, endoscope. The indications, as you know, are difficult intubation, compromised airway, 
and intubation of the conscious patient is preferred. Very important. You uh, want a conscious patient. And <clears throat> so the important thing is the psychological preparation of the patient. You need to have an active participation of the patient. He should be informed of what is what he's going to undergo, what is the procedure. The pharmacological uh, aspects, very important to give a mild sedation, a pre-medication to the patient in the form uh, of um, um, minimal um, short-acting opioids can be given and topical anesthesia. Now, this is very important to give appropriate topical anesthesia and uh, using an anti silog to make sure that the mouth is dry while the procedure is going on. Now, the conscious sedation would include fentanyl and midazolam, which we practice here, or remifentanyl where it's available. Now, the topical anesthesia, uh, let's see the video to understand what can be done. PowerPoint feature and feature. So uh, the patient has already been explained about the procedure and the nasal airway has been put to dilate when lubricated with jelly has been placed into the patient's uh, nostrils so as to lubricate it. And uh, it needs to, very important to connect the patient to the monitor to see the heart rate, the blood pressure and to get an IV access. Very important because you need to give some drugs and to uh, even uh, in case you need to paralyze the patient eventually. So that is very important. In any kind of emergency, we need that. Now, preparation would include which can be in the form of uh, an ultrasonic nebulization, which can be given with 10%, uh, uh, 4 ml, 4% uh, of 10 ml of lignocaine. This can be given to the patient. And you can see how comfortable the patient is uh, because the anesthesiologist has been continuously in contact, talking to the patient and explaining the procedure. So after this nebulization, uh, installation of oxymetasoline or any vasoconstrictor can be done. Or even cotton pledges <coughs> with lignogen and ADR can be uh, soaked and placed for 10 to 15 minutes in the nostrils. Apart from this, nerve blocks can be given like superior laryngeal nerve block and a trans laryngeal nerve block can be given with 2% lignocaine. And after that, in this, uh, as this, uh, in this case, you can see para-oxygenation is being maintained using an oxygen tubing in the other uh, nostril while the fiber optic is inserting and the patient is able to visualize comfortably and undergo the procedure. So as we reach the epiglottis, this is the time where the patient might sometimes undergo a slight discomfort and a cough may emerge. So then you can either spray and go with the lignocaine or benzocaine through the port of the fiber optic and uh, or a minimal sedation can be, can be given to the patient at this time. And as you can see, the vocal cords are clearly visualized here. And soon they're going to insert the endotracheal tube. The patient is very comfortably able to visualize the insertion of the endotracheal tube with no discomfort. So after which the fiber optic is removed and our procedure is done. So we can connect to the ventilator if you want, need to undergo surgery.
So the failure of fiber optic would be because of lack of team effort, because of poor topical anesthesia, plenty of secretions of blood, and a distorted anatomy. And finally, equipment related could be fogging and inadequate lubrication. So at this time, I would hand over to uh, Dr. Ashish for the rest of the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Christina. Now, if you had seen, Dr. Christina was presenting the upper airway as upper airway issues as it would be evaluated externally. Now, I am going to uh, I am going to tell you how to evaluate the airway through the ears. Can you see the airway through the ears? Seeing the airway through the ears, I will be talking to you. So to understand that, you need to understand how is voice generated. Voice is generated by three things. You have a reservoir, which is the lungs. You have a vibrator, which is the vocal cords. And you have a resonator, which is the oropharynx, nasal cavity, and the paranasal sinuses. So if there is a lesion in one of these areas, it will produce change in voice. You don't need an endoscope to diagnose that. You need to hear to the patient. Okay. Now, if there is a Christmas, the voice will become like this. The patient won't be able to open the mouth and the resonance that is generated by the oral cavity, oropharynx is lost. If the patient has a nasal obstruction, his voice would become like this. That is, the nasal resonance is lost. Now, the larynx, lesion would produce a change in voice. I have some videos I would show you how a change in voice appears. That means there is a laryngeal lesion. Now, if there is a laryngeal lesion that is change in voice with a strider, that would give you a clue that the airway is narrow. And obviously, the lung lesions, the patient won't be able to speak you know, sentences. The reservoir would be poor. Okay, so let's see those videos to understand what I just said now. So here is a patient. Listen to the voice carefully. Okay, so you can see there is a change in voice and this is the laryngeal picture of the same patient. This is the larynx of the same patient. Uh, we can't hear the uh, sound, Dr. Uh, no, there is no sound in this video. The previous video, could you see hear the sound? The no, no. The previous video? No, no, no. That... Uh, that old man speaking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no sound, no sound. Okay, they, how about they? Share sound. Share Sorry about that confusion. Uh -huh. yeah. Is it audible now? Yeah. So you can hear the change in voice. And the same person's larynx is showing this. You can see the growth in the vocal cord. Same patient. So this is, you know, this. Okay. This is the growth, but there is nice airway. Here, still preserved. Now, if the airway is distorted, patient would produce strider. Now, a word about strider. Strider are of three types. If it is, uh, you need to see whether it's the noisy respiration is during inspiration, expiration, or biphasic. The inspiratory strider would be seen in a supraglottic lesion. A biphasic strider would be seen in vocal cord, the cervical trachea, and the upper part of little bit of thoracic trachea also. Now, if the patient has a inspiratory strider, we can straight go ahead and do a tracheostomy to get access to the airway in a situation where there is can't, I mean, no, you don't allow it to happen. Can't intubate, can't ventilate. Patient has strider, straight away plan for a, and you see a growth, straight away plan for a, a tracheostomy. But if it is a biphasic strider, evaluate. If there is a laryngeal growth, clear cut, glottic growth, subglottic extension, Yes, again, tracheostomy would help. But if it's a cervical trachea and you do a tracheostomy, it is going to be a disaster. So in a biphasic strider, always, always evaluate the airway where exactly is the lesion, okay? Now, again, 
This patient, you can see, is having a biphasic strider. Inspiration and expiration both are producing noisy respiration. Listen to it carefully. Okay, a same patient's vocal cords. Same patient's vocal cord. What do you see here? The vocal cords are in the midline, bilateral cord paralysis. Both the cords are in the midline, abductor cord paralysis. The larynx is not opening and your tube will also not go. So if a patient has biphasic strider, evaluate the airway. Where exactly is the obstruction? Check it and then only plan for you know, the next step. So in a biphasic strider, you can see here, there is no airway and plan an elective tracheostomy for this type of patients. Again, here you can see a patient. Now, if the strider is not pronounced, you can ask the patient to you know, keep the tongue protruding out. That exaggerates the strider and you can hear the strider more clearly. Here you can see the same thing. The patient has kept the tongue out. The bifacic strider. And you can hear the voice. Okay. So you can see the you can see the patient having strider and the patient having portions of voice. So the glottic airway would be compromised again in this type of a uh, patient. Okay. So remember our first case: can't intubate, can't ventilate. The large, you know, oropharyngeal, you know, there is a lot of edema in the oropharynx. The edema in the larynx can't see the airway at all. What would you do? You need three things, just three things. One is your index finger, second is your scalpel, and third is any tube. So, in this picture that you see here, they are using a boogie, boogie or a catheter or a tracheostomy tube, whatever is available because you can't afford to lose the time. It's very important that you do it quickly so that there is no hypoxic brain injury. How to identify the cricothyroid membrane? This is the index finger. Take it from the symphysis menti, keep palpating the strut. Go vertically downwards. The first notch that you feel there is the thyroid notch. Sl keep sliding the finger down. And then the next thing that you feel is the giver sensation between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid. And that is the cricothyroid membrane. Okay, so that is the cricothyroid membrane. Now, just 0.5 to 1 centimeter above is the true vocal cords. Okay, so whatever you are doing, you have to do it in a point or all the instruments, you know, towards the trachea, not up. If you do that, you will injure the laryx or vocal cords. The second thing is, when you are palpating the cricothyroid, mem cricothyroid membrane, the cricoid cartilage forms the part of the subglottis. Respect the cricoid cartilage. You don't want a subglottic stenosis at a later stage, which is very, very difficult to treat. You know, prevention is better than cure. In this part of the body, it is more true than any other, I would say. So, this cricothyroid membrane, the uniqueness of the cricothyroid membrane area is, there is skin, there is fibroelastic tissue, and there is this mucosa and airway. That's it. No blood vessels, nothing. All that is there is skin, fibroelastic tissue, and the airway. It's the safest area where you can you know, immediately cut, get the airway access, put whatever you have, a catheter, a boogie, or a tracheostomy tube, or endotracheal tube, whatever is available, put it immediately, secure the airway. You can't afford to lose the time. Now, a little bit anatomy about uh, the anatomy about the space. The distance between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage is 6 to 8 millimeters. What does that mean? That means you can pass an endotracheal tube of diameter of 6 to 8 millimeter. But try to put the smallest possible because you don't want to ins and cause any damage to the cricoid cartilage. Damage to the cricoid cartilage would result in subglottic stenosis. Please avoid it. Okay. And you have a nice length of horizontal length of 2 centimeter. So that's a quite a big area that you can uh, handle. I mean, have it. Okay. This I already said. Now, cricothyroidotomy. Three things you need. Again, I would be reinforcing this still cricothyroidotomy. 
is you know properly hammered it scalpel index finger and a boogie that's all you need when would you do cannot intubate cannot ventilate contraindicated in children who are less than 10 years severe neck trauma where you can't palpate the landmarks or there's a large hematoma subglottic extension is there you can't in those patients you would go for cricothyroidotomy you will avoid cricothyroidotomy yes these are the things that you need okay scalpel a mosquito and a tube if you have a cricoid cart a cricoid hook cartilage that's well and good dilator again a good thing to have this video shows how the procedure is done Position yourself. Okay, so again, you can see here the thumb and the middle finger is holding the thyroid cartilage, and the index finger is trying to palpate the cricothyroid membrane. So you are stabilizing with those two fingers, the thumb and the middle finger, and the index finger is palpating the cricothyroid membrane. Make a vertical incision there. once you make a vertical incision yes you are using your index finger to dilate it okay and then a mosquito or whatever you have instrument just open that airway and you can use a mosquito your dilator whatever is available take a cricoid hook lift it up if you don't have a cricoid hook use the mosquito and pass a tube whatever tube is available here we have a tracheostomy tube So tracheostomy tube is passed. Okay, complications as usual, and uh, there, there will be you know minimal bleed because of, but it won't be so catastrophic that it will you know uh, go into the airway and you know we can the bleed would be whatever minimal bleed is there in the skin and those areas. If you pass the tube into a false passage, you can have emphysema. next is a mini tracheostomy here what you do is mini tracheostomy is simply a cricothyroidotomy done with a tracheostomy uh, you know with a tracheostomy tube here you do a plant tracheostomy palpate again, the cricothyroid membrane with again i would say avoid mini tracheostomies because you are on the cricoid cartilage don't touch the cricoid cartilage respect the cricoid cartilage stay away from the cricoid cartilage you don't want a subglottic stenosis okay this is again a emergency procedure put a needle see the direction of the needle it's towards the trachea why because you have the vocal cords about that you don't want to touch the vocal cords okay and you have 6 to 8 mm you know distance so put a needle guide a, uh, pass a guide wire through it and then once the guide uh, needle is removed along the guide wire you know thread the tracheostomy tube and it would go inside the it would go inside the uh, airway there the next thing that you can achieve is you know very easy is you know take a needle and you know attach a syringe to that and you know you can ventilate you know these are all you know desperate situations where you don't want to lose the time okay so whatever is available a thick bore needle you can put and then again you can uh, continue Hilarious. with the uh, you know ventilation tracheostomy this has to be planned this has to be planned and it takes time so in case of a respiratory cessation or a rs you need a airway you can't intubate can't ventilate the only thing that you need to do is a cricothyroidotomy you can't afford to you know arrange for tracheostomy it would take time and you know 4 minutes would easily go off and he would land up with a hypoxic brain injury okay i i don't want to go into the steps of tracheostomy there is a video but you know because there is no time and you know uh, skipping this slide and again percutaneous tracheostomy is done mainly in icu settings uh, dr christina's team would be doing it but i won't be very happy because you know it's a blind procedure i think pratik if he is there he can tell us how they do percutaneous there uh, do they have a ultrasound to see the anterior jugular vein and you know locate that and stay away from those things and percutaneous tracheostomy you know is contraindicated simply if the patient you can't palpate the trachea you know obese patient where you can't palpate the tracheal ring you will enter into false passage or if the patient has a cervical injury again you won't do this procedure the types of tubes that we have we have a you know a cuff tracheostomy tube this is the common one which we use in here in cmc 
If the patient has a thick neck, then we use a Vicon tube. Here you can see the collar is adjustable. And this again, just for the sake of completion, we have this Biovena silicon tube, again expensive tube, not available easily. These are some of the other tubes. You have a fenestrated tube here where the patient can talk. Okay, the voice, the patient would have a good quality of voice because the air would go from the you know, shoulder of the tracheostomy to the uh, tube, to the larynx, and he would be able to phone it, and the other tubes are there. Okay, now how do you decide the size of the tracheostomy tube? I remember my MBBS days, my ENT professor used to tell us the size of the trachea is equal to the size of your thumb, and the endotracheal tube, the bronchoscope or the tracheostomy tube has to be the size of your little finger. That's the easiest way to remember. But there's a formula also, age based formula, where the inner diameter can be calculated by age divided by 4 plus 4 or inner diameter can also be calculated based on the weight where weight divided by 10 plus 3.5 is done. Now complications of tracheostomy, 3.5% complications are there and it's all uh, uh, procedural and late complications, bleeding, anterior jugular vein if it's not taken care, it can bleed from the thyroid isthmus, infections can be there decannulation, accidental decannulation. So, you know, make sure the tube is properly sutured. Tube is properly sutured to the skin so that there is no accidental decannulation in the first 72 hours when the stoma is maturing. So, if there is accidental decannulation, please arrange a tracheostomy set bedside of the patient and then, you know, use the retractors and then only you can put the tube back. Now, one more complication which I would like to tell you is tracheoinominate fistula, which is fatal. We have seen some patients having this and we are lost in the past. So the care that needs to be taken is, you know, don't over inflate the cuff of the tracheostomy tube. We have cuff pressure monitors available in the ICU settings. Please use that and keep the pressures low and deflate it as every two hours for five minutes so that we don't have this kind of complications which are fatal. Care of tracheostomy, this is very important. I would say everybody who is walking in the hospital should be able to remove a blocked tracheostomy tube and change it. It's not the duty of the critical care consultant or ENT specialist to block, remove a blocked tube and change because a blocked tube also, if it persists blocked for more than four minutes, hypoxic brain injury, you don't want that. So everybody walking in the hospital, every doctor must know how to remove a blocked tracheostomy tube and see whether the tracheostomy tube is painted. Very easy. Just, you know, keep your hand in front of the, you can feel the blast or take a wisp of cotton, keep in front of it and it would be moving. Okay, so when do you plan decannulation? We keep getting consults. Docs up, decannulate kardo. We do three things, evaluation. One, whether the patient is aspirating. If the patient is aspirating, we will never remove the tracheostomy tube. Second, does the patient have a right tube? Why are you keeping a right tube? Remove the right tube. If he is feeding well without aspiration, then only send for a consult. And the third is whatever the cause for which the tracheostomy was done is uh, taken care. If these three things are met, we check the air, airway, we would do an endoscopy, check the airway, and then remove the tracheostomy tube. Okay. Yes. So here comes the piece for the medical students. Use your fingers, fastest fingers first. Right, what would you do for this case number one? The patient who arrested on the table. And we have, you know, you can put it in a chat box, the answers. And whoever answers it fully, correctly, would, would get a prize. Okay, so let's see who would do it first. What would you do for this patient? A single ping we want. And the correct answer would be getting an award. Okay, so what we did for this patient? Uh, I'll wait for a second. Okay, we are, we are, we will take note of those people. So what we did, I will tell you. So this patient, we shifted onto the table. He is a six feet, four inch, huge, tall guy. He stopped breathing. The anesthetist said, we can't do anything. Fortunately, the patient was being taken for a tracheostomy. Tracheostomy set was ready. We took the tracheostomy blade. I palpated the cricothyroid membrane, made an opening, put a tube immediately, and they started breathing. Uh, I mean, started oxygenating. Patient, you know, came out of the problem. 
and we took him back to the ICU and he was fine. And within two days, we converted into a regular tracheostomy. We don't want that trichotherapy to persist more than, you know, you know, till the general condition improves, we kept it. And once the general condition started improving, we converted into tracheostomy. Please don't keep trichotherapy tubes for a long time, cause subglottic stenosis. And he keeps coming back to us, OPD. He's lost weight. He's, you know, he is now, you know, he, he's fit and we keep telling stories that you stop breathing and you scared us. And he la uh, laughs at that. The next patient can't intubate, can't ventilate, large vellicular cyst. I was called, I went inside, evaluated. I saw this gap there. So what I did, I took the endotracheal tube, with the tip of the endotracheal tube, I lifted the epiglottis and passed the tube into the vocal cords. And I said, what do you want me to do? Shall I remove the cyst or you want to go ahead with the urological procedure? They said, please remove the cyst. So I excised the uh, vellicular cyst and the uh, patient was you know, extubated without any problem later on. And the third patient, Ludwig's angina, we, we said, we are not going to uh, give any muscle relaxant because there was you know, a talk, you know, if you give muscle relaxant, his mouth opening will improve, then we can intubate. I said, nothing doing. We would do a proper planned tracheostomy, go ahead, and then you do the uh, drainage. So we went ahead with the tracheostomy, and then we did a, uh, we did the, so the take home message, every difficult airway, every airway should be thought as a difficult airway. You know, have the checklist in your mind, follow those checklists, and if you think that this is going to fall into a difficult airway category, call for help. Never shy away from help. Call the senior most person available in the on duty that day. Prepare, stay calm. Okay, don't press panic buttons. So you won't see things what are available if you press the panic button. Don't press panic button, stay calm and perform the procedure. Have little bit of doubt, you can't intubate. Call the ENT or the surgical team to do a tracheostomy. Okay, watch for post-op surgical complications. Deflate the cuffs regularly. You don't want, uh, you know, tracheo innominate fistula or a tracheal stenosis, deflate the cuff regularly. You all should know how to change the tracheostomy tube. Okay, a block tracheostomy tube, everybody walking in the hospital must know how to do that. And plan decalation, once the rice tube is out, patient doesn't aspirate, you plan at that point. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Uh, so there is no safer airway than that a room with the an anesthetist and the ENT surgeon. I think you all agree with that. And uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Rebecca Filippos who helped in preparation of the slides and the TV ending for the clinical videos and the photographs. Thank you. If you have any questions, sorry, we were planning to finish at 45. It went a little late. If you have any questions, please, we would be happy to answer. I think Pratik is still there or we can involve Pratik also to answer some of the questions. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, please? We'll be happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Ashish, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, uh, it's an excellent presentation, uh, Christina and Dr. Ashish, uh, because we do come across this situation several times. I have just uh, two comments. One is uh, when we are doing tracheostomy, we have to make sure neck is fully extended. Because yes. many times we have realized uh, 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 roll sheet is not placed on the shoulder, neck is flexed or partly flexed. It causes a lot of problem. Yes. And the uh, other point is we have to stay at the midline while we are doing tracheostomy or any procedure. Because uh, and while, while we are doing, after every step, we have to make sure we are feeling the trachea, we are in the midline. Because initially, I mean, in the beginning, it happens we will deviate away from trachea and sometimes we feel spine as well. We think, oh, we are on the right track, yes. but we can lose the track. And the other thing, Dr. Christina, any experience with congenital anomalies? Like sometimes babies, they have uh, macroglossia and all. We do come across. And if uh, that is there, uh, what to do? And uh, one more experience I would like to share is sometimes unexpectedly we come across a uh, difficult airway. We are not prepared, though anesthetist has attempted once or twice or thrice. So in that situation, what we have done in theater is we have postponed the procedures and next time we will plan everything and then bring the patient to theater rather than 
you know, half heartedly attempting on the patient and causing further damage to the airway. So that also we have tried occasionally. Dr. Christina, any experience with congenital omelies? Yes, sir, we have, uh, we have come across uh, this valicular cyst. Uh, uh, I also wanted to mention that I was also there in the same uh, case. And uh, I remember that we, uh, in this patient, we had, we were thinking of premedicating the patient in the recovery and then shifting because it was an OPD basis child. And uh, somehow the child was cooperative and came inside. But uh, the moment we put in an IV, we gave inhalational anesthesia and we put in the IV and we gave a, just a little bit of ketamine the child just started desaturating and face mask ventilation also failed. So, uh, I mean, we were not anticipating because from the airway physical characteristics, from the jaw, from the mouth opening and everything, it was not at all, you know, anticipated. Now, at that moment, I when I saw the dipping saturation, I knew that I needed help. So, the first thing that I think, whether it is a congenital anomaly or any such thing is when you realize that you, you are unable to do it, immediately call help because that time is very valuable. That four minutes, you cannot afford any kind of hypoxia. And here, with a face mask, I could not do. I uh, With two uh, people, we tried to mask ventilate, we failed. So now we try to place a supraclotic device. We inserted the, uh, the LMA, but we did not know there was a huge cyst sitting there. So the ventilation was impossible for us. We had to remove the SGA because now the, dip, uh, the saturation was dipping down to almost 40, 40%. And at this time, I think uh, Dr. Ashish was called in and then we attempted the laryngoscopy once the, we had inserted uh, a, a small airway into the uh, nostrils. So we had just uh, whatever we could do to uh, make sure that the saturation picked up to at least about 80%. And then by the time sir came, then we attempted once, we attempted the laryng uh, laryngoscopy and saw the cyst. And uh, it was only after the removal of the cyst that finally the airway was patent and we could go ahead. So, so it's very, yeah. Correct. You, you are right. It's very important to ask for the help and uh, good you ask uh, NS, uh, ENT specialist. And uh, in theatre we have seen, uh, it, uh, we should involve surgeons also, like you are on the other side of screen. If you find problem, immediately inform them. Once we had to stop the protomy and we shifted uh, towards the NS, anesthesia side and did tracheostomy just to restore airway. So it's very important to ask for help and uh, rather than struggling alone. Okay, uh, one more point, let me tell you. I said, do endoscopy with the ears. Uh, valicular cyst, oropharyngeal mass would produce a hot potato voice. Ask the patient whether ever there is a change in voice. What was the voice in the past and has it changed? It's a very important thing to ask. If there is a change in voice, think that there is something you know abnormal happening in the turbulence of the airflow. Okay, and if there is a change in voice, please get a consult from the person who can evaluate the airway through the endoscope. So history is very important. History of change in voice. You know, that gives you a clue whether there is obstruction or not. And so for the congenital anomalies that you were mentioning, uh, like uh, I have uh, seen uh, Dr. Valsa and Dr. Narjeet, ma'am, whenever such a case is there, first of all, the assessment I've seen, they go into a very detailed assessment of the child, one or in fact a week before, so that the planning can be done. So the, how we are going to, you know, do this, uh, uh, do the anesthesia, give the anesthesia for the child. So usually it's always that uh, there are at least two or more experts in the in that uh, theater with all equipment possible for the uh, difficult airway, whatever we would require so that we don't waste time in trying to procure that at that moment. And of course, with either an ENT surgeon or a pediatric surgeon who can help us uh, secure the airway at any time we, we fail, you know, in our uh, attempts at an endotracheal intubation. So I think with all that preparation, assessment, and planning, you know, we, we can get success. No, no, no Dr. Christina, you are correct. Uh, once patient was, uh, many times it has happened, patient is referred from other hospital for surgery. So we will, being a surgeon, we will start thinking patient is referred for surgery. But if you take detailed history, they will tell you uh, intubation was attempted in other hospital and they were not able to intubate. And that's why they have referred to other hospital. So history is very important. Uh, many times we will come to know somebody has attempted intubation outside and particularly anesthetist and they were not able to do. Dr. William, there is a question for you. Uh, the availability of pediatric tracheostomy tubes. 
the doctor tanya rachel isaac is asking uh, is whether it is available and how do we manage uh, pediatric tracheostomy tubes as per the need of the child we do get tracheostomy tubes you know it's a planned procedures accordingly so we assess the child uh, we always ask for two tubes suppose you are not able to put one tube smaller size should be always available with us and then we do tracheostomy is a planned procedure it's, uh, in icu and all we don't do emergency procedures we do have tracheostomy tubes according to the uh, you know size of the child baby yeah i think there is another question uh, by dr benit um, so the, what is the minimum uh, size endotracheal tube that has to be kept in uh, different uh, areas like uh, wards and icus yeah so uh, for the adults for the adult uh, male it should be uh, size 7.5 or 8 Eight uh, internal diameter, eight uh, millimeters, and for a female it should be around seven, six point five and seven. See, when you're expecting a difficult airway, it is always good to keep smaller size tubes because we may not have experts, uh, people, you know, anesthesiologists everywhere. So for a novice or somebody who's struggling, a smaller size tube is fine because what we need is to maintain a patent airway. We can always exchange a bigger tube on, you know, with a with the tube exchanger. um any more questions uh, uh, next week uh, dr uh, deepak abram would be uh, speaking he would be speaking on the art and science of uh, practicing medicine as yeah. a colleague yeah yeah uh, thank you very much and uh,